So, um, we are in Psalm 118, 10 through 21. Salvation in the Lord. At salvation, we, we sometimes, I think, put it into one little category. That salvation is just the Lord saving us from our sins, and we get to live with him forever. That's certainly salvation. But salvation is also what happens while we're on earth. Sometimes the Lord spares us or gives us grace. That is salvation as well. Sometimes the Lord helps us with situations that are beyond our control. And as you all know, because I think I talk about it a lot, um, we struggle with the situation with our son. Not just this year, but he's 18. We've been struggling with this for 18 years. There have been all-nighters where he's been awake all night, and we have had to stay awake all night with him, struggling. We've had to tackle him. We've had tension that's come between other members of the family, between us because of this. And, you know, there are times when you're tempted to throw in the towel, but you can't because there he is and you have to help him. But unfortunately, one of the last things I think about sometimes, maybe you're the same way, is prayer. I try to tackle it myself. I try to handle it myself. I try to do all this, and then I get really tired, and I'm like, oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah, the Lord's there. I should, I should ask him for some help. My mom has told me a, more than one occasion that she thinks that the Lord chose me to be Andrew's dad because I'm special. Because the Lord gave Andrew to me because of how special I am. I think that is absolutely incorrect. Even though she has good intentions, I don't think that's correct. Because I'm not special. The Lord doesn't choose people because they're special. The Lord chose Saul and the Lord chose David. No, the Lord gave me Andrew so that I would know how special the Lord is. The Lord gave me Andrew to bring me to the brink of my own weakness so that I would know how much I really can't handle, so that I would have to depend on him. That's what I believe. And if you've ever experienced that kind of thing in your life, we all have different things. They're just different, right? Um, That's where this psalm really comes in and teaches us about who the Lord is in our lives. So let's begin. We're going to begin with verses 10 through 13, Psalm 118. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. Have you ever felt surrounded? Like everything is kind of coming in on you from all sides. That is what's being described here. I don't know who wrote this psalm. It evidently was not David, because usually if it's from David, it says the psalm of David. But it probably was a king who wrote it. Somebody who knew what it was like to be surrounded or have their city surrounded. The word surrounded is used four times. And you get this distinct feeling that it's on all sides, that there is no escape. Have you ever been in a situation where there's just no escape? Or sometimes you have several decisions to make, and it seems like none of the decisions are good? Sometimes there's one good decision and three bad ones. But sometimes it seems like none of the decisions are really that great, and you just have to choose the one that's least bad. You may have felt that experience of being surrounded, like there is no way of escape. That is the time uh, that this person is writing this in. And they say that the enemies are like bees, that there's vast numbers, there's great intensity, like a fire among thorns. And that would be very furious and brief. When you're in the middle of something, at least when I'm in the middle of something, I get really dramatic about it. Like this is, oh, this is a terrible thing. And life becomes hugely horrible because of this thing. But you know, most of the time, it really is very furious and very brief. It's just a little blip in life. And I think that's what this experience was for this person. They're surrounded, and it's a very furious and brief moment, and they said they were pushed hard so that they were falling, but the Lord helped me. 
It's interesting, they say they are pushed hard. I was falling, and then they say, in the name of the Lord, which means by the power of the Lord, is by his doing, that they cut them off. So they were falling to their enemy, and then they cut them off. The word cut them off also means circumcised. Ouch. Or, or just, they destroy the threat, really, is what it's saying. They cut off their enemy by the power of the Lord. In the worst of circumstances, in the worst of circumstances, when we feel like we're surrounded, when we think there is no escape, that is when the Lord is our help. The Lord is our help a lot of times, but I think we forget it or we get really clever. You know, I, I make a decision and I think, oh, that was good. I got out of that one. But then we totally ignore the, the Lord's doing in all of it. But it's at those times when we're surrounded, when we know we're weak, when something happens that's beyond me, and yet I'm, I get out of it or I, I, I'm able to go through it, it is then that I know that the Lord is my help. Lord is my salvation, verses 14 through 18. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The light, right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall die. Sorry, I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Um, this verse is an exact quote from Exodus 15:2, which is the first song in the Bible, where Moses escapes through the Red Sea. He knew that that wasn't his doing. He raised the stick, and the sea parted, and 600,000 or so Jewish people, went, the Israelites went through, Moses went through with them, and then the sea came down upon Pharaoh and his armies. The most powerful army the world had ever seen, the, the biggest superpower the world had ever seen, the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh, were stopped. And Moses knew that it was not by his hand. He knew the Lord was his salvation, and he sang this same song, which is quoted here. And he says in here that the Lord is my strength. The Lord has the power to save us. Sometimes we have to say that again. The Lord has the power to save us. You ever forget that? Um, you could get surrounded. You could feel the pressure of life coming in, and you just forget it. Not that you really forget it, but in that moment, you're not thinking of that. You're just panicking or whatever. But knowing that he is my strength, he has the power to save us. Regardless of whether I know it or not, he has the power. He is my song. He is the source of my song. He is the recipient of my praise. He is my salvation. He is the one who saves us from physical and spiritual danger. The Old Testament focuses a lot more on physical, saving us from physical danger, whereas the New Testament focuses a lot more on saving us from spiritual danger, the, like the power of sin. But both, you find both in both Testaments. Um, do you feel like you've ever been saved by the Lord physically? You ever come close to getting in a car wreck? Or you go through a car wreck and you realize it could have been a lot worse? That's one way the Lord saves us, is he saves us physically. And even though there's no guarantee of that in Scripture, there's no guarantee you're not going to die, it is still true that the Lord saves us physically all the time. And I think a lot of times we're not even aware of it. You're angry because something happens and you can't get to your destination on time. And, or you get, or you're, you're supposed to take a trip and for some reason it gets canceled. And you don't know why that is, but perhaps the Lord was sparing you from something. Or maybe just there was just somebody messed up and it didn't mean anything, but maybe the Lord is sparing you. I think this kind of thing happens all the time. But the Lord also saves us from spiritual danger, from the power of sin. The scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that if you're undergoing temptation, that you call upon him, and he will help you stand up under it or escape. He saves you from the power of sin as well. He is my salvation. And it talks here about the right hand of God. 
No offense to any left-handed people here, but in the Bible, the right hand represents, it symbolizes strength and favor. And there's a story in the Bible that, ex that really exhibits this. Uh, Joseph brought his sons to Jacob, his father, to be blessed. His sons were Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh was the firstborn. And in their society, the firstborn was the one that was treated with favor. They got most of the inheritance. They were intended to be the main heir. And they, so everything was given favor to the firstborn. But God often went against that pattern, against the pattern of the firstborn. So he brings his firstborn, Manasseh, and he puts it on Jacob's right side. And he brings his secondborn, Ephraim, and puts him on his left side. And Joseph, sorry, Jacob goes like this. He crosses his arms. He says, no, 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 dad. No, you just put your right hand on Ephraim's head. He's my second born. So here, here, dad. No, no, this right hand goes on Manasseh's head and the left goes on Ephraim. So the first born, the second born. And Jacob goes, no, I know what I'm doing. And he gives his blessing, his favored blessing, with his right hand to the second born. So a right hand meant favor and strength. And Jesus said, he told them in his trial, he said, I, I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And what he's saying there is his authority is equal to that of the Father, that he is the favored one. And from that moment forward, they were ready to kill him. They, they thought that they had what they wanted on him from that moment forward because of what he was saying. He had the right hand of the Father. We're also told that the Lord's hand does valiantly, we're told that twice, and that he exalts those who are in his favor. So the Lord acts with boldness toward those in his favor, and he lifts high those who are in his favor. So the question for me is, how do I get in the Lord's favor, right? How do I know that I'm in his favor? Because I want him to act with boldness toward me. I want him to lift me high. So how is it that we're in the Lord's favor? And that question does get answered in the psalm. He saves us, he gives us life, and the purpose of living, this, the psalmist says, I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. So he's surrounded, probably as a king, surrounded by an enemy, and he knows that he's not going to die. He knows he's going to live, and he says, if I live, I will recount the deeds of the Lord. That's our purpose. So when the Lord saves you, it is your opportunity to tell other people, to glorify in how the Lord has saved you. I knew a man who was electrocuted. He told me that he died. I wasn't there, but he, he said, this woman came along, and I, this woman told me the same story. She prayed for him, and he popped back up. He had 7,000 volts go through him, so it's pretty powerful. He had a big old hole burnt in his shoe from where the you know, spark went through. And he told everybody after that. This, he was a very quiet man, so he didn't say much. But after that, he went around telling everybody about how the Lord had saved him. That was exactly the right response. The Lord saved him, and he went and glorified God. The psalmist says that the Lord disciplines severely, but he has not given me over to death. The Lord disciplines us because he loves us, is what the scripture tells us. That um, he is a father. And a good father disciplines their, their child. And in fact, the Bible says if you don't discipline your child, you hate them. So the father is good when he disciplines you. He allows things to happen to us, things that are challenging to us, things that are beyond our ability to handle, in order, I believe, to discipline us in learning to rely upon him, to discipline us to remember to pray. It is for our benefit to make us holy. And Paul writes, um, when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined. So I think it says, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. There's two ways that we will face God, either as a father or as a judge. I would rather face him as a father because a father disciplines, but a judge condemns. And this psalmist is recognizing this situation he's in that's terrible, where he's surrounded 
that this is discipline from the Lord, but he knows he's not going to be given over to death. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. God doesn't deal with us in the way that we deserve to be treated. He treats us better. Otherwise, we'd be dead, right? I mean, he treats us better than we deserve, especially when we confess and we repent. He forgives. He has not given me over to death. And this king, you could imagine, is surrounded by an enemy. This might be Hezekiah, I'm not sure, because Hezekiah dealt with a situation like this. And he just knows that this is a difficult situation, but he will survive, and he will have another day to worship God, and that he will not be given over to death. Verses 19 through 21. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them, and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. So it talks about the gates of righteousness, and only the righteous are allowed to enter the presence of the Lord. So who are the righteous? And we're also told, we were told earlier, that the Lord acts boldly toward those he favors, and also... Well, now I've forgotten. I have to go back and look. Um, Oh, yeah, he exalts those he favors. The Lord favors those that are righteous. So we're going to look at what what is righteousness in Scripture. Um, So righteousness is obviously a conformity to an ethical or moral standard. If, If you say that somebody is righteous or that they're right or they're doing right, that they're conforming to some kind of moral or ethical standard. Everybody has a moral standard. Even Hitler had one. The worst gangsters, like if you ever watched that movie, The Godfather, I wouldn't recommend it, but even the worst gangsters have a set of morals and ethics, a code that they follow of things that they think are right or wrong. There was an armed robber named Dennis Lee Curtis who was arrested in South Dakota, and he was a thief. But apparently, he was a thief who had scruples because he had written down his own private code of things he would and would not do in armed robbery. And when the police arrested him, they found this list in his wallet. Here are Dennis Lee Curtis's private commandments. I will not kill anyone unless I have to. What a guy. I will take cash and food stamps, no checks. What a wonderful person. I will only rob at night. So you're perfectly safe in the day, right? I will not wear a mask pre-COVID, I think. I think it's pre-COVID. I will not rob mini-marts or 7-Eleven stores. If I get chased by the cops on foot, I will get away. If I get chased in a vehicle, I will not put the lives of innocent civilians on the line. I will rob only seven months out of the year. (laughs) He's really being good to the cops, to the law-abiding citizens. He gives him a break five months out of the year. I will enjoy robbing from the rich to give to the poor. Maybe good news for the poor. How does he know if they're rich or poor, though? Right? So as you can see, he had a a sense of morality. But could you imagine him standing before a judge in South Dakota after being arrested and telling them, well, I followed my own rules. I was a good person by the set of rules that I carved out for myself. The judge would laugh at him. No, in this state, you follow the laws of the state of South Dakota. That authority is much higher than you, Mr. Curtis. That's what he would be told, something to that effect. And there are people who have self-righteousness, that is, they have their own code of ethics, their own morals. They think that they're good people who will, I'm sure, try to stand before God and say that they were a good person because they have their own set of ethics that they followed. But according to Scripture, that is not the code of ethics that's important. It's based on God's ethics. Scripture is based on God's ethics. Now, God is the measure of righteousness. He's not righteous because he follows a standard. He is the standard. And his righteousness is demonstrated in many ways in Scripture, but I'm just going to mention a few of them. One of them is he always keeps his promises. How do we know that God's going to keep his promises in the future? because he's always kept his promises in the past. Why do we even have an Old Testament? 
because it tells us about the Messiah who's coming. He kept his promise in the New Testament. There are other promises that are yet to be fulfilled. We know he's going to fulfill them because he filled his promises in the past. He always keeps his promises, and that makes him, that's one of the things that tells us about his righteousness. Um, he hates and he judges sin. So do we. We hate and judge sin. We can't stand it if somebody gets away with doing something that's terribly unjust. And so the Lord shows his righteousness and his hatred and judgment of sin, but also in his mercy. Somebody commits a sin, they confess and they repent and he forgives. His mercy also shows his righteousness. And all of this came together and was expressed fully on the cross. The cross was a promise that God had made to Adam and Eve in the garden, all the way through to um, Moses and David. He had made this promise that he would do this. He would redeem his people, and he did. He, at the cross, we see God's hatred and judgment of sin coming full force on his son who took the sin on himself and took all of that punishment on the cross, we see the mercy of God, all expressed right there. So the cross is really a picture of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. A couple other things the Bible tells us about a righteous person. A righteous person obeys God's law. That doesn't mean a person who never sins, because otherwise, you know, then none of us could ever say that it was possible. Um, but it's a trajectory. If you ever say, if a teacher says they have a good student, they have a kid in their class, and they say, this student is a good student, do they mean that it's a student who never messes up? Do they mean that it's a student who gets 100% on every test and is always a good kid, always does what they should? Probably not. They just mean a kid who's generally a good kid. And that's a person who generally obeys God's law would be called righteous. A person who has mercy on the needy and the helpless, Job, in the Bible, had mercy on the needy and the helpless. They have compassion and generosity. That word compassion is proactive empathy. Here's what it means. If you see a homeless person and you feel sorry for them, it's good that you feel sorry for them, but it's not compassion. It's pity. Compassion is when you go up to them and you offer them something or you say, hey, um, instead of you digging that pizza out of the trash, would you like it if I purchased you a pizza? That's compassion. Compassion is when you act, and that would be a righteous act. A righteous person delivers the weak and does no violence to them and sheds no innocent blood. There are many versions of this, but uh, it's really there are oppressed people. A, a, a righteous person will help deliver a person who is vulnerable or weak. And I thought of the Alpha Pregnancy Care Center. Who is more vulnerable than the unborn? And they do no violence to them, they will shed no innocent blood, and they seek to deliver the weak. That's one example of that. Or the, the rescue mission is another example. A righteous person trusts in God's promises. This is really the center of what it means to be righteous in Scripture, is to trust God. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's Genesis 15, 6. So when God said to him, hey, um, I want you to pick up from Ur, and I want you to go to a land that I will show you. Abraham had no idea where he was going. He just trusted God. And he, can you imagine? He goes home to his wife and he says, okay, honey, let's, we're, we're going. Where are we going? I don't know. The Lord's going to show me. Abraham trusted God. And I guess Sarah trusted Abraham. But trust is the center of righteousness. Brings justice where they live. Where there is injustice, there is an absence of righteous people. We hear a lot uh, on the news and in the culture about justice. You hear that word thrown around a lot. In the Bible, the word for, uh, that goes very closely with justice is righteousness. And so where there is injustice, it means somebody has acted unrighteously. Fred Stoker says this, There's no such thing as fair. There's only righteous. When a person is living right, all the people who love him will automatically feel like things are fair in their relationship with him. But when a person isn't righteous and chooses to sin, suddenly nothing seems fair to anyone. A righteous person brings peace and reconciliation. It doesn't mean that you always would agree with somebody. That's not what righteousness means. 
It just means that if you're at odds with somebody, you work to bring peace between you. You work to bring reconciliation between you. And that's one of the things about righteousness. And ultimately, this is what righteousness is, a person who lives by faith. A person who lives by faith is a person who would be obedient. A person who lives by faith is a person who would be compassionate. A person who lives by faith is a person who would stand up for somebody who's vulnerable. You respond to God's goodness with love and loyalty, even through adversity. And Paul quotes Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous shall live by faith. That was the verse that Martin Luther discovered that turned the world upside down. The righteous live by faith. So ultimately, what kind of person will enter into the gates of the Lord? A person who believes God and acts accordingly. The sorts of righteous conduct we're told about in Ezekiel, God says, I shall sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, from your idols. I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So what is the source of the righteous conduct? It's God. It is God working in the heart of a person. He gives us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables us to actually behave in a righteous manner. So can we be righteous on our own? No, it's not possible. That's why the Bible says there is no one who is righteous, not one. We can only be righteous with God's help, in, with his spirit in Christ. The, the, uh, toward the end of the psalm, the psalmist says, you have become my salvation. Now, this is really interesting because the word he uses for salvation is a Hebrew word, Yeshua. And that same word was the name of Joshua, the man who led God's people into the promised land. And that same name is also used in the New Testament when a young peasant girl was about ready to have a very special boy. The Lord said that this will be my son. I will impregnate you with my son, and you will name him Yeshua, Jesus. Same name as Joshua. It means salvation. God saves. You have become my Jesus, my Yeshua. Scripture says the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. God is our righteousness. Our salvation is Christ. Christ gives us righteousness when we trust him. And then we can be in the presence of God. Oh, well, this got kind of all messed up, didn't it? The king himself entered through the gates of, righteous, gates of righteousness through his own merits on our behalf. And for that reason, we can enter into the gates of the Lord. And that is what the psalmist claims. What a great promise. Back in 1997, the Chicago Bulls hired a new assistant coach named Frank Hamlum. He was 55 years old, had served as an assistant coach for 25 years, but did not yet have a, a championship ring. And in 1997, on the Chicago Bulls, was a famous basketball player, Michael Jordan. Even I know who he is. I know you guys probably know who he is, right? Michael Jordan. And Michael Jordan comes up to Frank Hamlum, and he says, hey, uh, coach, I have a new inspiration this season. I want to win so that you will get a championship ring. And Michael Hamblin said, you know, there's nothing like the best basketball player on earth coming and tell you something like that. That really makes you feel special. And the Bulls did. They went and they won what they won in 1997, and Frank Hamblin got his ring. Jesus Christ has a similar desire for us. He is the greatest in the universe, and he is determined to carry on to victory and to carry us with him. He wants us to share in his glory. And when the Lord tells us that, that is something special.